everyone. Welcome to the Brickyard interview series. I'm Andrea Thompson, and today it is my pleasure to be chatting with Dr. Duke Redbird. For those of you who haven't heard of him, I don't know where you've been, but I'll read his bio uh, to give you an introduction. Dr. Duke Redbird is an elder of the Sajin First Nation located on the shores of Lake Huron. He's a celebrated Indigenous visionary as well as an established intellectual poet, painter, broadcaster, and filmmaker. Dr. Redbird is also a much sought after keynote speaker and policy advisor, an award winning multidisciplinary artist. Dr. Redbird was a key advisor on the development of the Indigenous Visual Art Program at OCAD University. And in 1977, his work was performed for Queen Elizabeth for her Silver Jubilee. Dr. Redbird has aided in the emergence of a vibrant Indigenous presence on the contemporary cultural landscape, most recently through his work as artist in residence at the Urban Indigenous Education Centre, where he reviews and revises the curriculum taught in the Toronto District School Board. A vital force of cultural knowledge, human rights education, and creative innovation, Dr. Redbird's poetry has been published translated and celebrated around the world for over half a century. Dr. Redbird, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Uh, well, uh, well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to meet new people and uh, to share my poetry when I, whenever I can get the opportunity to do that. So... Well, I would love to jump right in. Do you want to oh, shoot yes, off yes. the top? I would love to hear something. Oh, you want to you want to hear a poem? I would love to if you want to share one. Absolutely, I I I, I love this because uh, it's a new <laughs> new poem that uh, that I just wrote, uh, and uh, and uh, considering the the uh, season we're into and. Uh, and all of the information that's out there now uh, about uh, Indigenous people, uh, I thought that this this poem might help to enlighten the the uh, the, the general public about uh, an Indigenous lens, which I call colony felony. Awesome! Fresh off the presses, peoples. Here we go. <laughs> The day before Columbus arrived on Guanahani Island in 1492, the Tano people spent the day fishing from hand-carved canoes. The gardens were tended, the weather was splendid, the children played and splashed in the waves, while elders shared stories from previous days. The people were content and they loved their life. They lived in an enchanting paradise. On Cape Breton Island in 1497, John Cabot was praying to heaven. The Mi'kmaq people were in sacred ceremony, singing honor songs with chant and drum to Mother Earth and Grandfather Son. The celebrations to the strawberry moon had just begun. The elders were delightfully making decisions while young people prepared for future expeditions. The elected Sagmas were distributing canoes and supplies. That was the day before John Cabot arrived. In 1534, not to be outdone, the French sent Jacques Cartier, their navigating son, to sail into new lands in treacherous waves seeking gold and resources to satisfy their greed. The Anquahanwe Nation, keepers of the Eastern Door, were carrying out their daily chores, planting gardens and squash bean and corn, the smoke from the longhouses billowing in the sky, were testament to the vitality of the Haudenosaunee lives, rich with the gifts of our Mother Earth, there was nothing more they needed to survive. That was the day before Jacques Cartier arrived. Samuel D. Champlain came in 1603 with muskets, gunpowder, and disease invading the river that flowed to the sea. This was the cherished home of the Anishinaabe. 
Champlain called us savages. There is nothing he could see that corresponded with the false equivalency that puts man after God at the top of an imaginary hierarchy. The Anishinaabe were motivated by gratitude and romance, hunters and gatherers who raised their young with art, music, and dance. That was the day Champlain arrived to steal the land for France. In 1611, the English hired Henry Hudson to find a shortcut to the spices of Cathay. He sought the Northwest Passage, but was fated to lose his way. Sailing into the icy inland sea, he found himself surrounded by nature's bounty. As far as the eye could see, Chippewyan, Assiniboine, Inu, and Cree. They inhabited this sacred territory. In 1670, King Charles II put his beloved cousin, Prince Rupert, in command of the territory now known as Rupert's Land. The area was five times larger than France. It was a charter the crown had no right to grant. This was the outright theft of an entire continent. The year was 1670. In 1867, the Fathers of Confederation rejected Indigenous representation when they named Turtle Island the Dominion of Canada from sea to sea to sea, declaring the war on anyone who disagreed, the Indian nations were then the enemy. It is now the year 2022. The Indigenous people are seeking the truth, while the government is seeking reconciliation for inflicting 352 years of death, deprivation, and starvation on the bodies, minds, and hearts of the Indigenous nations. But Canada cannot wipe away a pain like that without the truth. Reconciliation is an impossible task. 16 British monarchs have come and gone and nothing has been done to right the wrongs of a system that normalized the policy of cultural genocide, never conquered, never purchased, nor ever ceded. We didn't agree to having them held in trust. It was a treacherous deception thrust upon us. We have to distinguish fiction from fact and asked King Charles III for a new compact and get him to agree to hand the crown lands back. Canadians can nurse the 11% they own with a promise to leave the rest alone. Only the original stewards of the land can reverse the harm that's been done to our mother, the earth. We're all becoming ancestors of future generations. And I would like everyone out there to collaborate with the Indigenous peoples of Canada to help design through education, the architecture that will guide our citizens and our country toward a more perfect future for us all. Miigwech. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Thank you so much. Wow, that was that was powerful and comprehensive too. Um, and it made me think, you know, one of the things that I really wanted to to speak with you about is about the role of spoken word um, in it, as a vehicle for uh, truth telling and um, advocacy and history and tradition keeping. Um, my familiarity and my ancestral background goes way back um, on my paternal side to Africa. And I know in Africa, there's the role of the griot, who is the history um, keeper and the storyteller and the tradition keeper. Um, I, I was wondering, how would you define the role of orature and spoken word in in indigenous culture, especially as an as an elder, what function um, do does it serve for you in order to impart uh, your knowledge and wisdom? Well, 
you know, uh, we lived here for a hundred thousand years, notwithstanding what the uh, what the uh, uh, archaeologists have been trying to tell us uh, that we we came across the Bering Strait. No, we didn't come across the Bering Strait. We've been here for a hundred thousand years, and in all that time, we didn't have a written language. Mm. We had spoken word. Mm. We had an oral culture. Mm. We communicated with each other uh, in uh, in uh, pictographs uh, and and sign language in different ways. Uh, the, and the pictographs were our emojis, yeah. just like the, uh, the students of today, the children of today, the young people of today are using emojis and they're using uh, 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 science and sign language and so on to communicate and to get their ideas across. And they're using spoken word. This is. This is the is embedded in the DNA of of of, of Homo sapiens. Mm. We've always communicated that way. When a little child is first born, the first uh, thing that that it does is communicate with uh, with, a, with a spoken word. It may just be "mama." That spoken word mm. that is demonstrating. A, a, a desire to communicate and to be heard and to be recognized and to be loved and to be shared mm -hmm. with the community. Spoken mm -hmm. word is everything. Yeah. And when you put it to music, the heartbeat of the of the of the of the, uh, uh, of the human body and the drum beat, and you start getting a beat and you start talking and and. Uh, <laughs> See how the beaver works all night without light in the darkness. He builds his dam with limb and branch, mud and sand. From dusk till dawn, his toil goes on and on and on. Then tomorrow you will see a bubbling stream become a pond and later on a stagnant lake. And all the creepy crawly creatures will crawl down and make a home in that future pond with, with smoke, snakes, snail and crab. These are the neighbors the beaver will have. But the deer, bear, lynx, and fox, raccoon, wolf, moose, and hawk will move far away to find a place the beaver's heaven being where clear, cold, clean water still flows, living, laughing, tumbling, liquid life, waterfalls, brooks, and streams. These are highways for life's dreams. My child, do not become a beaver and build for yourself a dam, for this is what modern man does with his brick and stone and sand. Till his mind is like that lake filled with weird, wicked wretches that give no peace. Then he cries to his creator in desperation, please God, my God, deliver me from damnation. Amen. Dr. Red Bird. Yes. <laughs> it's so funny, you know, before we were chatting, uh, before I turned on the record, we were chatting and you described yourself as one of the olding, oldest living rappers. And I can really hear that, 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 the, that I, I'm thinking about your use of rhyme, you know, as I said, I come out of like an Af Afro-Canadian tradition. My people came from Underground Railroad and before that, uh, Africa. And that, that, that use of the drums again is like, is, is paramount. The use of the, uh, of rhyme and rhythm um one of the things i'm really hoping that brickyard that this this channel where this video this interview will be is going to be used for is for young artists young emerging artists who are wondering how do i do that how do i get into that can you speak a little bit about your process how do you construct a poem well the uh idea uh uh comes by simple observation of uh, the world around me and the world that I see every day. And there is many different ways that uh, uh, we can uh, express ourselves. Uh, and uh, uh, poetry is one of the uh, uh, best ways because uh, it uh, can condense through metaphor uh, so many comp complex ideas and uh, you know it can be uh, something just just a moment that that somehow touches your heart like uh, well, a poem like this uh, uh, just a short little poem uh, it goes like this uh, did I see a leaf 
fall from that tree. Little leaf, I do not know your name, but I have seen you fall. You did not fall like a stone from the sky. You did not swoop like the great hawk. You drifted and you sang a song. Your song is in my heart. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And it speaks to so much more. As you said, that leaf then becomes a, a representation, yeah. an avatar. That's right. Yeah. Just a moment of intersection of 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 uh, of awe and wonder mm -hmm. and curiosity and questions mm -hmm. that uh, that uh, we respond to and and can uh, express yeah. uh, and uh, you know uh, can be. Uh, uh, as short as three words or as long as uh, 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 a thousand words doesn't matter. I've, I've, I've heard, I, I, I did some research on, on your work and, I, and there was a couple of poems that I saw um, that are online already. Um, I am Canadian and Stolen Children, Stolen Land, which came out before really the residential um, grave sites uh, were really in, in the, the children um, were in the news. Uh, so there was almost a prophetic quality to it. Does the, um, when you're writing a poem, is it, I mean, for me as a writer, a lot of times it's like, I, it's like, I think of it as something that goes off the emotional Richter scale. You know, I, I'm feeling so much. I'm now I'm too full and it has to come out. So for you, is it like an inspiration in the moment? Is it sometimes like something that you're, that you're contemplating? You spoke of just like observing and kind of catching a moment, but for, these more kind of declarational, especially like tradition keeping historical document poems. Do do you brew them for a while before they come out, or is it just like okay? Well, what what happens uh, to give you an example? The uh, stolen children, stolen souls. Uh, that that was uh, happened because I was watching television and in, uh, in uh, two thousand eight when uh, Prime Minister. Uh, Harper uh, apologized for the residential schools. And as I heard the apology, uh, he talked about the survivors of residential schools, but he never once mentioned the ones who didn't survive. Yeah. And I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I thought, this is not reconciliation this is not telling the truth mm. this is just uh an a, a apology without without any substance and i went outside uh in the forest near where i i lived up in uh, the algonquin park area and as i was walking through the forest i I imagine that I heard voices of the children speaking and wanting to be heard. So I uh, listened for an hour or so, and I walked back in the house, and I got a pen, and I sat down, and I wrote what they told me to write. It was fairly straightforward. <laughs> I love that. It's, it's like cosmic dictation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. Um, so you do, right now you're in a school. You, you do a lot of consulting for schools. And again, I'm thinking about the youth and young people coming out. I know spoken word, you know, uh, is a very youth oriented um, art form right now. I mean, I'm older, you're an elder. So there are a lot of practitioners of all ages, but it seems like young people are really attracted to it. Um, is there something that is like that keeps coming up when you're doing your advisory work for the school boards um, or just cultural advisory that is, you know, like something that I, I would love to just give you this platform to um, to get that message out? Is there something that 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 we need to know um, that that you would like to share with us? Yeah. Uh... <laughs> there, there's, there's, there's so, so much uh, 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 to know. Uh, um, I, I, I think uh, uh, some of the things that that 
that's not taught in 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 uh, in our classrooms is that that eighty nine percent of of the land of Canada is still called Crown land. Mm. Yeah. Uh, wow. uh, and the inference uh, uh, is that it has been inherited uh, by the present monarch, mm. Charles the Third, who's our head of state. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, only eleven percent of of uh, Canada is privately owned. Wow. I mean, that's a lot of land. Eleven percent of Canada is a huge amount of land. I mean, it takes Toronto and Winnipeg and 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 Calgary and uh, you know uh, uh, across uh, from coast to coast. But even all the settlements that have, that go all the way from Newfoundland to to British Columbia to the uh, to the Northwest Territories in the Yukon only represents eleven percent of the total land mass called Canada. Eighty nine percent of that land is occupied by Indigenous people. With with. Uh, with without any uh, 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 sovereignty or or, or self determination over their own lives, the indigenous people who live in that eighty nine percent of Canada that's not occupied by settlers is controlled by a Department of Indigenous Affairs who control everything about indigenous lives without the freedom without every what 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 the what the uh, uh the um settlers on the 11% enjoy a democracy that is denied even today to indigenous people who occupy the other 89% that is called crown land yeah. yeah. That's thank you for for sharing that. Um, you know, and, and it, it makes me think too about just the the just the title, like just the the phrase crown land that I've grown up, you know, I'm in my fifties, so over fifty years hearing that phrase and hadn't really don't always kind of connect what does that mean? What does what does what does that mean? That means you know that the crown owns the land, and it made me think about the connection between language and our ability to be as as human beings. Um, and I'm curious about in in the indigenous um, perspective, self sovereign, um, and with indigenous languages, um, you, you know, not being honored, not having the um, you know, going extinct in many cases. How do you, how do you see that that connection between um, between language and our empowerment as humans? Well, the 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 uh, the uh, when it when it comes to uh, I'll give an example of how language uh, uh, has been uh, used as a weapon against uh, Indigenous people. Um, there's a uh, uh, something called a treaty. Uh, and people often hear that, yeah, we had treaties with the, uh, with, with the uh, federal government and with the, with the crown even. So, so uh, uh, <laughs> the Oxford Dictionary defines a treaty. What do you think the dictionary says a treaty is? I don't know. What does it say? Well, I'll tell you. It says it's a formal agreement between two or more sovereign nations. That's what a treaty is. Mm. Or another definition of a treaty is a formal agreement between people, mm. especially for the purchase of property mm -hmm. at a price agreed between buyer and seller. Mm -hmm. So when you have two completely opposing definitions of the same word, it's called a contronym. Mm. And it opens a possibility of deception, fraud, and intentional misrepresentation. Mm. 
Slippery. So the indigenous signers of the treaties between themselves and the Europeans understood the word treaty to mean a formal agreement between two or more sovereign peoples. Mm -hmm. The European colonial military authorities assured the indigenous peoples that they that the treaties they were agreeing to were agreements between sovereign nations. Mm -hmm. So the First Nations traditionally you know, they had their own governance systems in which women often uh, held the majority uh, of uh, positions of power. But when the uh, when 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 the treaties were were translated by the civil authorities representing Canada, they deliberately used the second definition of the word treaty. A formal agreement between people, especially for the purchase of property between a buyer and seller, mm. which wasn't what the indigenous people understood the word to mean. But yeah. when the when the civil authorities and the lawyers got a hold of that word, they changed the meaning. Yeah. And that was a deliberate misrepresentation to swindle the autonomous indigenous lands from the indigenous people. There's an example how one word. Yeah. Given two different definitions, written in an agreement, can deny a people their rightful place in the world in which they live. Weaponized language. Yeah. Wow. Weaponizing language. Yeah. Wow, I'm so happy that you <laughs> spent this time uh, chatting with, with me today and that I get to share this with the Brickyard audience. Um, we're coming to the end of our time. I'm wondering if there's another poem that you'd like to share to lead us out? Well, uh, uh, there's, uh, um, uh, let me see you, I, what, uh, Maybe because we're in the middle of winter, I'll, I'll, I'll share a poem I wrote called Summer. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. My spirit stood upon a psychic shore and looked across a lake of troubled memories of seasons like flags unfurled and flapping in the winds of my discontent. And I saw summer's face gazing upon my subliminal horizon, floating almost invisible like a gossamer vapor spun by magic looms lodged in the deep forests of my mind. Well, the summer was past, and the laughter of our love was now an echo, skipping like a child down some distant garden path. And I looked around to see what summer had given me. There was a golden ring and the silver, the silver of my spirit and the turquoise of my soul. My body still felt the imprint of that embrace when summer's hands caressed my face and love shined like a finger in the sand, traced outlines of faded conversations that we believed were very grand. Summer is a season that cannot let go. And even as the frost begins to turn the leaves, she's looking back and blowing kisses to the world she left behind. And from a golden beauty with roses in her hand, she turns another color and thus disguised seeks out her lover as storm-filled clouds gather in distant skies. She comes and tells you that she's not gone and melts the tears she finds in ice-glazed eyes. And even as she seeks easy hibernation in your memories, she runs with you through sunswept meadows and washes her hair and relinquished dreams of summer's magic crystal streams. Summer has a pollen that she sprinkles on the wind and hopes that there are blossoms that she can cuddle in. But in the fall, the flowers have all gone their way, and summer finds only empty fields in which to play. Perhaps if I had known summer in my youth and allowed her arms to mature my soul in truth, then heartache may not have accompanied me while playing with summer in fields of flowers. Wow. Bravo. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Dr. Reverend, your memory is a wonder. I love it. You know, um, you're just, yeah, you're just, you're, you're taking me back to, to, to my first love of poetry. I was raised by my grandmother and she always remembered poems. She learned when she was a little girl. So I grew up with this, you know, I, I have something to say, but I'll say it better in a poem. 
and um, hanging out with you this last uh, this last half hour, I guess, has been um, yeah that experience of a pure love of language. So um, and educational. So I just can't thank you enough for spending this time chatting with me, sharing um, your wisdom and your words with the Brickyard audience. If uh, people's out there, you want to find out more about Duke Redbird, he's been doing his thing for a very, very long time. There's a lot a lot his the bio that i shared is just a tiny tiny tip of the iceberg of his contributions to uh ca canadian culture and international culture if you want to find out more please go to www.dukeredbird.ca um so and if you want to uh, see more uh interviews like this we we've got lots of content coming up please uh like share and subscribe i mean share this because people have to have to hear what this man has to say um and we're still trying to build up our subscribers we're still trying to monetize uh, uh dr redbird and i were talking about this how you know artists we aren't we ain't, we ain't into working for free so if we can get this uh, channel monetized um we have a profit sharing uh policy in place if any of our videos go viral so please help us do that um support the channel um, and uh, come back more. There will be more content like this. Well, maybe not as good as this, but more content <laughs> coming up. So uh, thank you again, Dr. Redberg. And welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye.